Welcome to Worship Conversations. Uh, I'm Matt Hill from Audacious Worship, and I'm joined this week by Johnny Bird. Welcome, Johnny. Hello. Thanks uh, for having me. That's cool. We've got a bit of a different uh, worship conversation for you this week because I basically wanted to use this as an opportunity to uh, talk about the song story of the song How I Love, which was written by Johnny and myself. So, um, Johnny, maybe can you just give us everybody a bit of a background, you know, what got you into music and 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 your uh, just a very brief thing of your journey to becoming a superstar producer? Wow. <laughs> In in two minutes. Yeah, two minutes, yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Well, um, I'm Johnny. I'm originally from Bristol in the UK. And um, growing up, my my dad, he used to be in a band in the 80s, um, like a synth wave, kind of Duran Duran kind of style. Awesome. And so my dad's a musician, like bass player, actually. So always had loads of instruments around the house and... And uh, he had a home studio as well. I mean, his day job's a solicitor, so it meant he would come home from work and just make music for fun. But it meant that I got to, was surrounded by all this amazing equipment and yeah. quickly like fell in love with making music. And I remember I would, he had an old Atari, do you remember those? Yes. And I would just, as a teenager, I just like sit and, sit in the studio like recreating my favorite songs in midi on the atari <laughs> <laughs> on it it was like the old notator which turned into logic yeah <laughs> so that was fun um fast forward moved to brighton in 2009 and um i did bim there which is the brighton institute of modern music and um, playing guitar yeah. And then uh, around that time, uh, this new church was starting in Brighton called St. Peter's. And I managed to go along to the first ever service of that. <laughs> and oh, wow. by the second week, I was on the worship team and played guitar every week for about three years, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and um, like a few years into the church, um, Matt Redmond started coming along. And then about six months later, Martin Smith started coming along to church. So, you know, because I was playing guitar every week, I just ended up playing guitar for them loads and becoming mates to them. Yeah. And then when they wanted to start doing other gigs in the UK, um, it kind of naturally happened that I ended up playing guitar for those guys. And then um, through that, I met yourself and yeah. met loads of amazing people and, ended up playing for lots of other worship leaders and worship bands. And and now, these days, I'm a producer and mixer full-time. This is my home studio. And um, just get to tour, you know, like a little holiday every now and again. <laughs> with playing mainly for Martin. Um, so yeah. it's, it's a good life. <laughs> yeah, and you're also sort of... Um one of the worship pastors at St. Peter's, I guess, now? Uh, I, yes, I am now. <laughs> by, by default. So my wife, Sarah, has been uh, one of the worship pastors at St. Peter's and for Bright City, and we're just about to have our third baby. So uh, I, I said this wow. time, well, why don't I do your maternity cover? <laughs> so it's kind of mad, me working for a church. If anybody who knows me would yes. know that, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm loving it so far. Great. Well, at the moment, I don't have to go to I have to, I have to go to church, so it's perfect. Yes, you're doing it all from home. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah, and uh, so we we obviously met through you playing with Martin and coming to Audacious, and yeah, um, and we've been good mates ever, ever since. Um, yeah. And I think I, I wanted to talk about this song because we've we've recently released it. Um, but obviously we, we wrote it, worked on it together. And um, I thought it might give people a bit of an insight of sometimes how songs uh, are, are written and maybe some of the ways that, that you work as a producer and, and in developing and honing songs and stuff. And, and that might give people a bit of a, you know, um, sort of an insight into how these things work. Um, mm. So, so how, how I love you. Um, Thank you. <laughs> love you too. <laughs> 
<laughs> the end. Um, how, how I Love You started, um, I think it was January last year, I believe. Um, I've got a few notes written down so I can remember exactly. But I remember basically being um, having nothing to do um, because <laughs> generally nothing happens in January. And, um, and I just sort of locked myself away in my studio and I gave myself this um, sort of challenge, which was to record a song with all the cheapest equipment I had, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that... There, there was nothing spiritual about it at all. Um, <laughs> it was literally like I had a a very cheap uh, uh, recording software that I was using instead of Pro Tools. Um, I had I sort of cobbled together all my cheapest microphones and <laughs> and this guitar which I bought on eBay for 180 quid and, and have been gradually um, doing it up over time. Um, and and I was like, I wonder how good you know. A recording I could make with uh, with all these like cheap things, and that was basically what I was, I was just pottering about. And and the idea, um, I can't remember which bit came first, really, but but some of the ideas of of how I love you started to emerge in that. And um, it comes from Psalm sixty one, which says, "Lead me to the rock that is higher than I," um, and that's sort of where the lyrics started. Um, and it's a funny one because I guess in that month or so, I, I pretty much made what was kind of a finished song and I started playing it to people and some people were like, oh, that's good. Some people were like, you know, didn't say anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> people don't tend to be um, negative. People are polite, but sometimes when they don't say anything, you know what they really mean. Um, and uh, so so that was that. I, I got a friend... Uh, a mutual friend of ours, Dan Galachi, to play some drums on it. He's also a producer. And so he started going, oh, maybe if you chop this bit out, you know, and stuff like that. So it started to, that, that was probably a couple of months later. Um, so I started to see the song develop a bit then. But mm. it, it was only when, which was, I think, September, then we were on tour in a tour bus in Europe. Um, that's actually when the sort of song came back around and, and I guess because you were forced into it because you couldn't run run away because we were on a bus. I was like, mm. listen to this song. What, you know, what do you think? Um, so just can you explain a little bit about when you're, when, when someone shows you an idea like that, um, what are you looking for as a, as a producer, as a songwriter? What's your first sort of like, what, what bits are you looking for? Um, what's your sort of start point before you start giving any feedback or other ideas? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I think, first of all, I'd like to start by saying, as a songwriter, there's kind of like, you've kind of fallen into a few different categories. And I yeah. think I I feel in, fall into the category of, I'm really good at starting a song, and really good at finishing a song. Right, but I'm yeah. terrible at the bit in the middle, <laughs> which is <laughs> actually like writing the song. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the hard work bit. I'm useless at. <laughs> so yeah. I, I'll either, when I'm writing, I'll be very happy to come up with a thousand like initial ideas, whether that's like a riff or like a lot of a lot of uh, Army of Bones songs or yeah. Martin's latest album. Kind of would start with me on on guitar, just like jamming something in sound check, and Martin would hear that, and then he'd go and actually do the hard work and turn it into something. Yeah. Um, but then the the other side of it, being a producer, yeah, you get very used to hearing songs when people might think they're done, but it's trying to bring that kind of last, taking it from good to great, yeah, and adding the last ten percent. Um, so yeah, I guess when I'm looking for a song like that, ultimately, does it make you feel something? Do you kind of connect to it, whether that's the lyric or the melody? Or, yeah. or it might be, yeah, that's a really cool riff or really cool, like, even like a song might have a, just a really good vibe. You might change everything yeah. about it, but like the tempo was good. <laughs> so yeah. so there's, there's, always some, there's always something in there yeah. that's going to be great. <laughs> um, but so I remember for this song, 
it was a sort of half time thing when you brought it to me, right? Yes, yeah. We and could maybe was- try and insert a clip of it here so that people could hear it. Like that. <laughs> so I, I remember thinking, oh, this is really cool. I love, I love the melodies, I love the theme. Um, but I feel like it could have a bit more energy and um, it kind of feels like a, the sort of song that you'd want, you know, to play first or second in a set that yeah. kind of gets the ball rolling. And so I was like, oh, why don't we kind of make it the full time thing, maybe change the tempo a bit and have a look at the, have a look at the general vibe of it. Yeah. And then once we kind of did that, it seemed to all kind of fall into place. I think we, we tweaked a couple of chorus melodies just to make it a bit more exciting. Yeah. Or stop well, I, it being I, I, I mean, that's, to- yeah, that's an interesting thing because actually I, I mentioned Dan Galachi had, had worked on it and, and, um, cause he was playing some drums in, on the early demos and, um, he was trying to like suggest we make the, like we sort of cut a bit out of the, of the chorus and, and that might make it, that sort of made it more punchy in terms of a, a song. But then what you were saying was, you know, a, a general church congregation would, would find that, that sort of change in timing a little bit confusing. And so sometimes for a congregational song, you actually need to sort of um, preempt a little bit the way that people are expecting it to go it has to go that way so that they know what when to sing the next line. So if you do anything that's sort of too clever, you can cause a disconnect with the congregation. And so your your idea was um, adding that line, which is, my heart is crying out to you alone. Um, and I remember when you were just like, oh, how about this? My heart's crying out to you alone. And I was like, yeah, great. <laughs> and it just, some, sometimes it's, it feels like the smallest change. Yeah. But that's all it needs. It's like the key to unlocking the box sort of thing. It's like, it's like, oh, mm. all we needed was that tiny bit. And mm. now it sounds finished. Mm. Um, but I guess like what was helpful for me was that you, you brought that sort of direction to, whereas I was just thinking, oh, here's a melody, here's some lyrics, here's an, like an idea, but I didn't really have a, like a plan for it, or I didn't have an idea of where it would go. It's like yes. you then suddenly brought in this sort of, I guess, like a vision of, yeah, but this could be a number one song, number two song in the set. And so what could we do to make it fit that category? Yeah, it's and kind then, of, yeah, visualising the, where do you see it fitting? Yeah. And then try to help it get there. Because, I, yeah, I do find like a plan does help. Mm. And like a, knowing where you want it to go. Otherwise a lot of songs can sort of drop off the off the map a bit, off off the radar, because you don't know where you're gonna do it in a set yes. or yeah. especially when you're writing for um sort of church worship stuff. I I guess another analogy as well would be I always think of when we're writing church songs, it's a bit like Chinese whispers, because you've got like I think of all the rows in church and you basically want your song to make it to the, the person at the back row. <laughs> yeah. So why well, you have to sometimes make your melody or make the song slightly simpler than you would if it was just a regular pop song, because kind of got to get through all these layers of, of rows of people in the congregation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause so, you want, you want yeah, the vibe. Like, the vibe to just click with the front rows as all the young people who are just like into it. And yes. then you also want the sort of depth to, to mean something to the back rows or, or, or the middle rows, should we say? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And, and the back rows, there needs to be some sort of intrigue or something fresh that they're, they're brought more in, into it. Yeah. No, I like that. That's cool. Um, so do you, um, uh, I guess, you know, when you, when you are, finishing a song like that and and we talked about having the sort of plan and the and and an idea about where the song fits um how how do you do that for so obviously i think you know you've been to our church you know me so you have a bit of an idea of that context if you're working with someone who who maybe you've never worked with before how how do you sort of 
judge the context or or work out what what would fit for a song that you're writing you know say you're writing with someone for the very first time yeah that's good that's a great question um i think usually i would do a bit of research right i would kind of see what what they've done before have a listen to a few songs and the kind of yeah get a sense for their context and and their kind of usual writing style and and where where their stuff kind of needs to fit and where it needs to land and and i i kind of i really like working with limitations because it kind of forces you to be a bit more creative so mm. for each project that come in i i'll give myself like little rules or little kind of guidelines right okay so for this artist it needs to sound like this we can only use these instruments or this kind of palette of sounds and it kind of stops the uh the option paralysis yeah if you, if you can do anything then you just take millions of hours to try all the possibilities but i yeah. find it's really helpful to just yeah make a little plan okay we know we want it to sound like this we want it we know it wants to feel like this and we we'll, we'll use a lot of references as well like oh, yeah. i'm loving this song loving this artist and you, you never you're never copying one thing, yeah. but you're taking all those different things as influences and all those different guidelines and rules, and you kind of come up with something that's completely brand new out of that stuff. Um, so that's it's always a kind of a mystery as well <laughs> how it happens. You yeah. never you're always chasing something. You're never like oh I know exactly what to do. Um, and that's part of the fun, isn't it? It's completely yes. different every time. And what what you write on a Monday would be completely different to what you write on a Tuesday. And yeah, I guess I guess that's different. like the funny thing is that you know I guess people would see creative types as as the ones who go off down that rabbit hole. And and as a, as a producer, your job is to kind of sometimes push people down the rabbit hole, but then sometimes rein it in and and make sure the project actually gets finished. So, mm. so you have a kind of a, a bizarre job of being halfway in between the sort of uber creative type and also the, the, you know, the planned detailed, you know, yeah, but the if we, as well, yeah, like yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like we need to actually finish this project and it needs to be on time and on, on budget and all that sort of stuff. So you're thinking about, it's like two different sides of your brain. It is, yeah. I mean, uh, um, working together though, and I think that's a really interesting. I mean, I've really enjoyed working with you over the years in di on different projects, and um, because there are times when you like are pushing me to be better, and you're and you're saying, "Come on, there's there's a better idea," or 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 why don't you do this, and why don't we like jam those two ideas together because that'll be crazy or whatever. <laughs> but then there's other times when you just say, yep, that's good enough. And and I'm going, Oh, but I, I don't think, you know, and then the, like the perfectionist side of me is like, Oh, we need to do it again. We need to do it again. And you're like, mm. no, it's good enough. It's fine. And, and you actually, as a, as an artist or a creative, I guess you need something that's not really talked about too much, but I guess it's starting to be talked about more is that the collaborative process is so important like the the mm. idea of working with a team is really important because if you're left to your own devices then like for me if I was left to my own devices, I would never finish anything um, yeah, yeah. because I would never trust that it was good enough so I would and, and historically that's what I've done whereas I think when I'm in the church team or when I'm working with a producer like you then the helpful thing for me is being told that it's good enough and I can stop now you know, and I'm like, oh, okay. Well, if Johnny thinks it's good, then I trust him. So that's good. You know, yeah. no, <laughs> um, that's so true as well. Like in lockdown, I've really struggled. Uh, we were right. chatting before this, yeah. like, because you're working remotely with people, you know, on, and, and the technology is brilliant. Don't get me wrong. Like Zoom and there's like software, like audio movers, so you can stream your sessions to people, and it, yeah. it's incredible but I really miss that collaboration and being in the room together and bouncing off each other. And, and everything just takes three times as long when I'm working on my own. Cause <laughs> yeah, cause I, I need somebody to tell me as well. Yeah. <laughs> like I need to be like, 
when you're producing someone, it's not like you're the boss and yeah. you're like, no, this is what we do. It's, it's totally like you were just bouncing off each other and, you know, you completely push each other. And that's what I love about it. You're just getting to collaborate with all these amazing people. So I'm kind of really missing that at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. You are definitely a, a vibe sort of person. Like you, you definitely, you're all about vibes. like you're in the room and you create a vibe and, um, that's definitely one of your, one of your things. It's like creating that atmosphere in the, in the studio or wherever you're working mm-hmm. that's conducive to whatever that song is you're working on and, and the artist feeling, you know, in the right frame of mind to deliver a good performance and all that's those, true, yeah. all those things. Um, well, I, somebody said to me, it's called playing music. So it should always be fun. <laughs> so in my sessions, whether yeah. that's writing or, or producing like it's got to be fun and it's got to be you know obviously there's times where you're writing a sad song or it's really emotive but mm. I guess as long as you're feeling something it's got to be like quite an emotional experience whether yeah. that's pure joy and you're bouncing off the walls jumping up and down because like you've got the coolest melody or yeah or you're crying together with someone because you really like got in touch with what this song means to someone and so yeah always looking for an emotional response and yeah when you're creating music I almost I'd rather make something that someone loved or someone hated (laughs) rather than (laughs) sit in the middle (laughs) yeah and like oh I'm indifferent to that (laughs) yeah yeah no that's I remember um yeah like you saying to me you need to like, I, I think I'd been given the advice of, oh, if you just sort of bring it into sort of the middle road, middle middle of the road, then then more people will like it sort of thing. And you were like, oh, don't be stupid. Like, you need to find what's you and then go to the absolute extreme of that because, like, you need to be 100% you as opposed to 25% of that and 25% of that, you know, and you end up not being anything. And uh, that's always always has stuck with me because if, like you say, if you, if you do something which nobody really loves, then, then it's kind of like, meh, but, you know, why did you do that? Whereas as art, I think art should be provocative, really. I think art should be, um, should have something which someone will be gravitate towards it. Someone might be a little bit off put by it or, or question, or oh, what, where's that coming from? But it's like you say, it's got to do something to you, to your heart. It's got to, to mm. pull the pull the heartstrings in some way, um, and yeah, I guess it's hard when you're when you're like a, a people pleaser and you want everyone to be happy. Um, but, yeah. but also, you've got to be true to yourself and 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 what's uniquely the gifting and the anointing that God's given you. And yeah, so, totally, so you've yeah. got to go. Well, if this is something God's given me, then I'm going to go to a hundred percent of that and and discover all that can be discovered you know, on, on that side. Um, and, and I think that was, yeah, that was really good advice and, and helpful for me. And I think, you know, you mentioned about being the editor and knowing what to chop out, you know, how that's probably one of the things I've just matured in recently is just being able to quickly go, yeah, it doesn't need that. Just chop it out. But how, how do you sort of explain that to like, if you've got an artist and they're really excited about something, you know, when you're saying it'd be great, but let's just sort of cut this bit out, that cut off the excess fat, you know, how do you sort of go about that without offending said artist or songwriter? <laughs> <laughs> well, it all comes out of relationship, doesn't it? I think yeah. Yeah, that's good. You've got, before you can sort of really dig deep into, I mean, it's, it is really emotional, isn't it? When someone mm. says, oh, that, that bit's cool, but it could be better or let's make that hard. Like you're going to listen to that a lot more if they're your mate or if the, if you know it comes from a good place and they're not like just trying to cut out your ideas because they want their ideas <laughs> you know, instead. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, and it's the same with our worship team as well. It's like the more we sort of hang out and, trust each other then the better music you end up making at the end of the day so it all comes yeah. out of being mates and 
and doing it together and being for each other and yeah. and, and and like you said it's looking for the bits that make it unique as well and make it like that's your character and that's what, what you've put into the song and like not kind of chop all of that out as well yes <laughs> um, yeah. yeah that's good I, I know I wanted to um just end by coming back to the the fact that the song started out of um psalm 61 um with the hold lead, lead me to the rock that is higher than I think and and I don't think you would even have been thinking about it but I, just as a little encouragement to you I realized that the the very first verse of Psalm 61 says, hear my cry, O God, listen to my prayer. And I thought that was cool because the line you added basically was, mm. was my heart's crying out to you alone. And, and basically without knowing it, you sort of, that line completely ties it back into the original verse yeah. that, that, that it, the song came from. And I think That's the essence of the, of the song. Yeah. Yeah. Which I think is interesting that you, um, you know, you weren't there at the beginning and and you're sort of brought in to an almost finished song, and uh, but I guess it's like you're saying the collaboration and the and the relationship because all of that is there, and and you're for each other, and you and you know you're then what you the tiny bit you added just was totally in line with with like say the essence of the song and, and where the song had come from, and it just seemed to sort of finish it off in in a great way, and I guess you know that's a nice story and. And it's good when things happen that way. I, they don't, they don't, don't always necessarily work out that way. And there's probably quite a few songs on both of our hard drives, which have never <laughs> and will never see the light of day, unfortunately. But thankfully, there are songs like this, um, which do have a happy beginning and a happy ending. Um, and you can stream it on all good streaming platforms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but thanks, Johnny, for, for chatting to us today. Um, oh, thanks for me. being a part of the song and um, and all jokes aside you can find uh, How I Love You on, <laughs> on Spotify, Apple and various other places um, we've got all sorts of resources that you can find on audaciousworship.com um, and there are others in this series of worship conversations on Instagram TV if you, you follow Instagram at audaciousworship then you will find uh, those other conversations there or on our YouTube channel. Um, so please go check all those things out. You can find chord charts and backing tracks and everything for, for free on the website audaciousworship.com. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>